Hello, everybody. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we are going to be talking about trauma-informed medication-supported recovery services. And uh, before I start, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Bia Carlini. Uh, I work in the Northwest ETTC as a systems change specialist, and today I'm hosting uh, the webinar. As this slide says, and we always get questions about it, uh, we uh, will be taking questions at the end. You can type it at any time, but we'll be taking at the end. Just keep typing, we'll get to it. I uh, also want to remember that, yes, this presentation will be made available on our website. It usually take us 24 hours. Uh, the, the link is right uh, in this slide and it will be in an ADA uh, compliant uh, format. So uh, that's why it takes 24 hours or so. We realize that we have a diverse audience today with us and uh, also who happens to work with a diverse population. And we recognize that words matter and we strive to respect diversity. If any of you, uh, of you have comments or suggestions on how this webinar can be improved in that area, please contact us. We'll be happy to hear from you and uh, our email is below in this slide. And then let's uh, get started. I wanna start by introducing you to our speaker today, uh, Lydia Barthlow. Uh, she is Associate Director of the Behavior and Health at the Blackburn Center uh, in Portland, Oregon, uh, and is extremely well qualified to talk to us today. She is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner and is doing doctoral work in trauma and substance use disorder. She has been lecturing many topics, and again, we are very happy to have her today. Thanks so much for having me, Bia. I'm excited to be here, and thanks to all the listeners for joining us today. So like Bia said, uh, my name is Lydia Barthlow, and um, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I did my doctoral work in the overlay between substance use disorders and trauma-informed care. I, uh, I'm actually no longer the director at the clinic named Blackburn. I, uh, I put in, I, uh, I sort of retired from that position so I could spend more time doing education and more time with my kiddo. Um, but my passion in life is, is really thinking about how to make substance use disorder services more trauma-informed. And so um, we'll talk a little bit in a second about, uh, about exactly what trauma-informed means. Um, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, it looks like I'm not, uh, I'm not yet in control of the slides. So you need to click on the screen, remember? There you go. There we go. Okay, great. So our agenda for today, we're going to talk just a little bit about language. Um, and Bia mentioned this uh, previously, but I want to I want to just dive in for a second because you're going to hear me use some terms that you have never heard before potentially. And I want to just review what we know based on the evidence to be recovery promoting versus stigma promoting language around substance use disorders. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about trauma and addiction. Um, so we're going to talk about sort of the neurobiological vulnerability that is developed when people experience trauma um, and allows for addiction and substance use disorders to arise. We'll spend just a moment talking about trauma-informed care and, and what that means. And then we'll dive into some of the details around medication-supported recovery and how to do medication-supported recovery in a way that is truly trauma-informed. So let's dive in to the recovery-promoting language. Um, I won't spend too much time here, but again, I, I just wanted to introduce this idea because there's actually um, a lot of research uh, out there about what words and what terms promote recovery and what words and tomes promote uh, stigma. So you'll notice that today's title is Trauma-Informed Medication-Supported Recovery Services, and you may not have ever heard the term before. 
Uh, most people refer to this as medication-assisted therapy or MAT. And I use the term medication-supported recovery or medication-assisted recovery, or I talk about pharmacotherapies um, because those are the terms that, per the evidence, suggest that recovery is possible and are as stigmatizing, as minimally stigmatizing as possible. You'll also hear me use the term uh, recurrence of use instead of relapse. Per the literature, recurrence of use is a more recovery promoting term and less stigmatizing. And you'll never use me hear terms like addict or alcoholic. Um, instead, we're using person first language like person with an alcohol use disorder um, or person with a substance use disorder. I myself identify as someone in long term recovery. So if I'm in a mutual aid meeting, you might hear me use some uh, some of those words. But when I'm operating as a clinician or when I'm talking to the media, for example, I'm always going to be using person first and evidence based language. So this slide here is just a quick review of, of some of the literature by one of my favorite researchers in the area, um, Robert Ashford. And part of the reason that I appreciate Robert Ashford's work so much is that Robert identifies as someone in long-term recovery. And I'm always trying to sort of centralize and prioritize the voices of people with lived experience of substance use disorders. So spend some time uh, looking over that literature if you, if you aren't already fluent in it, because I think it's really powerful and it's a very easy way for us to start chipping away at the stigma that exists around substance use disorders. So when we talk about the need for this talk, I always wanna highlight what we know to be the prevalence between childhood trauma specifically and substance use disorders. Some of the original adverse childhood experiences literature found that childhood trauma increased the risk of addiction, specifically IV drug use, in adulthood by 4,600%. So that's 40 times more likely to experience a substance use disorder in adulthood if you had a history of trauma in childhood. This, hasn't, this exact number hasn't been replicated in the literature, but we know that the overlap between trauma and substance use disorders is overwhelming. And that's part of why I really wanted to dive in professionally and think about how do we do substance use disorder services in a more trauma-informed way. We know when we are substance use disorder providers that the people that are walking in our doors and seeking our services almost universally have a history of trauma. And so how do we shift our services to be less punitive, to be more collaborative, more empowering, and more patient-centered and trauma-informed? So that's what we're going to talk about today, specifically as it relates to medication-supported recovery. In understanding the connections between trauma and substance use disorders, one of the most important things is to understand what allows the, the neurobiological vulnerability to exist that allows substance use disorders to develop when there's a history of trauma. And I think the reason for the importance is really that it changes the way we think about people who are existing with substance use disorders and living with substance use disorders. We have unfortunately uh, for so many years conflated addiction with criminality, or substance use disorders with lying and deceit. Um, we have often thought as people that have substance use disorders as people that, um, that we really need to uh, sort of control and ensure that their own, um, their own uh, decisions don't destroy their lives. And when we begin to understand the ways in which trauma sort of perpetuates uh, substance use disorders or engenders it, we really start to think about people that are seeking services for substance use disorders or seeking harm reduction services in a different light. And we see folks um, as people that we really wanna collaborate with and, um, and support in all the ways possible and really provide a lot of sort of clinical love to them versus providing a lot of um, power and control to them, which I think is something we've unfortunately done for a really long time in substance use disorder services. So one of the primary ways that we know trauma um, engenders some vulnerability to substance use disorders 
is the lack of prefrontal cortex activity that starts to happen after an experience of trauma. So when I'm talking about prefrontal cortex activity, what I'm mostly talking about is executive functioning. And we know that trauma changes the way that our brains function and allows there to be more activity in some of the fear centers of our brain and it decreases activity in our prefrontal cortex and executive functioning. And I don't ever want anyone to hear me saying that people that have a history of trauma are stupid or are dumb or have a low IQ. Instead, what I want us to think about is the way that trauma changes our brains and really primes us to be um, in persistent survival mode and decreases our ability to do emotion regulation, to um, have inhibitory control, to self-monitor, to pay attention, and to plan and organize. And specifically, when we're talking about substance use disorders, we know that emotion regulation is one of the primary reasons that people persist in using substances. So let's say that you have a history of trauma. Uh, maybe you have an ACEs score of four or five in childhood. And um, without your knowing it, you're moving through the world with not a lot of emotion control and, and you feel pretty anxious and pretty hypervigilant most days. And let's say that you go to the provider because you're having some back pain. By the way, your back pain is because your muscles are constantly tense because you're hypervigilant. And the provider gives you a script for oxycodone. Almost immediately, your emotions are regulated, your nervous system is soothed, and you're getting these oxytocin bumps, which allow you to want to connect to people and make people feel safer in a way that they haven't before. So we know that trauma allows us to really rely on substances to do a lot of emotion regulation for us. And this is connected, of course, to understanding the way that dopamine um, operates within substance use disorders. So dopamine, we've often considered dopamine in substance use disorders, specifically in the nucleus accumbens, we've considered dopamine to be a pleasure neurotransmitter or a reward neurotransmitter, excuse me. And what the most recent evidence is saying is really dopamine doesn't have a lot to do with pleasure. Dopamine has a lot to do with survival. So when we are in a persistent um, state of lack of prefrontal cortex activity, of hypervigilance, and we're really in a state where we're in a survival mode, dopamine becomes that much more powerful to our brains. And of course, substances that often become substances of, of misuse usually are highly dopaminergic. So our brains are primed for survival substances. And once we start engaging with substances that increase dopamine in our brain, our brain says, oh, I think this is the substance that's going to allow me to stay alive. And unfortunately, when we experience childhood trauma, and the, the mechanism of action here isn't well understood, but the outcome is well understood. When we experience trauma, specifically in childhood, we actually have lower levels of dopamine in our nucleus accumbens. So prolonged stress in our lives means that we are extra sensitive to dopaminergic substances. So if we experience multiple adverse childhood ex experiences, and then we interface with uh, a dopaminergic substance, that substance is, a, is extra powerful in our brains. It's, it's like a rocket ship saying, this is where you will survive. This is what's going to keep you safe. So everyone else, let's say at dinner, um, finishes dinner with a dessert of one bowl of ice cream. And the person with a history of trauma is thinking, gosh, I really need two or three bowls of ice cream to feel as satiated or to feel um, as dopaminergically activated. We think that this shift in relationship to dopamine is because of the inflammation that develops in our central nervous system after trauma. Um, but again, the mechanism here is not well understood. 
What we do know is that substances are really useful to regulate emotions when there's um, diminished prefrontal cortex activity. And we also know that dopaminergic substances become even more powerful and even more um, enticing when there's a history of trauma. And I've included in the references a, a lot of the different uh, research articles about how we understand this to be happening. And the final thing that I want to mention today is I want to mention that the amygdala is exceptionally high in opioid receptors. This is important for us because those of you that do a lot of thinking about trauma in the brain, you might remember that the amygdala is the part of the brain that decides whether something is a stressor or a threat. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that's gonna see a stressor and send a message that we need to go into fight or flight or trauma response mode, or decide that the world is safe and we don't need to go into a trauma response mode. So the amygdala is exceptionally high in opioid receptors, which means that for people that have a history of trauma, opioids in particular are incredibly soothing and make the world sort of transformed into a safe place. So I mentioned that in particular because when we talk about medication-supported recovery services, um, we're mostly talking, of course, about medications for opioid use disorder, although medication-supported recovery is a term that can be used for any use disorder. So much of what we're gonna talk about today is around opioid use disorder. So I've outlined three ways in which there's neurobiological vulnerability that builds out of a brain that's experienced trauma and that allows us um, more vulnerability to developing substance use disorders. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to go into some of the other ways, but hopefully I've outlined a couple of the key ways. Um, and again, I think this is really important because it helps us to change the way that we think about people that have substance use disorders. Um, we often think about people that have substance use disorders as people that are chronically lying or chronically deceiving or trying to manipulate us in some way. And my hope from understanding some of the neurobiological vulnerability is that we can start to see substance use disorders um, from a new perspective. We can see substance use disorders as a way that people learn to self-soothe and a way that people are going to feel like they're surviving. And that helps us to think about ways that we might be useful as clinicians in starting to change some behavior that's not working for people any longer. Because of course, when people show up in substance use disorder services, it usually means that the substance use, which originally allowed for amazing emotion regulation or really engendered a feeling of survival and safety for that person, it means that it's starting to decrease their functionality in other ways. So it's a skill that they've developed that's no longer serving them. But if we understand how and why that skill first developed, it's easier for us to partner with the person in understanding how we can be best be of best service for them. So let's talk just for a second about what trauma-informed care means. And I think this is important because I often hear people confusing trauma-informed care and trauma-specific care. Trauma-informed care is when we transform systems or communication styles or programming or even the way that we set up furniture to be attentive to people that have experienced trauma when they come into our services. It also means we're attentive to staff trauma burden. Trauma-informed care is not trauma-specific care. So when I identify as a trauma-informed specialist, it doesn't mean that I'm a trauma therapist. Uh, as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, I'm great at pharmacotherapies for post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma sequelae, but I actually know very little about brain spotting or EMDR or trauma-specific interventions. What I know a lot about is how to think about building systems that feel safe for people that have experienced trauma. My favorite way to talk about trauma-informed care is just to think about the way you set up furniture in, in an office. So if you think about from sort of a traditional perspective of how we would set up furniture in a therapist office, 
you would think, of course, first about the safety of the therapist. And you would set up the chairs so that the therapist had immediate access to the door um, if something odd were to happen with a client or something scary were to happen with a client. If you're thinking about how to set up an office from a trauma-informed perspective, you're gonna be thinking both about the safety of the staff person and you're gonna be thinking about the emotional safety and physical safety of the client. So when you set up an office from a trauma-informed perspective, you want both the client and the staff member to have equal access to the door. And that's sort of the heart of trauma-informed care. Again, it's not a trauma-specific uh, intervention. Trauma-informed care changes the way we think about providing services from more of a systems perspective to be attentive, again, to people that have experienced trauma. And we use universal precautions. So we don't use trauma-informed care just if people have experienced trauma. We assume that trauma-informed care makes everyone, regardless of their history and regardless of their experiences, that trauma-informed care makes everyone feel safer and is better care overall. SAMHSA has identified some guiding principles of trauma-informed care. They are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment and choice, cultural, historical, and gender issues. And so I thought a useful way to talk about trauma-informed medication-supported recovery services would be to just go through each of these guiding principles and think about how that might relate to medication-supported recovery services. And at this point, I'll shift a little bit to talking more specifically about what kinds of medication-supported recovery services I'm really focusing on here. Again, medication-supported uh, medication recovery services can be any time you use a medication in the treatment of a substance use disorder. So examples are things like gabapentin and naltrexone for alcohol use disorder. Uh, could be naltrexone and Welbutrin combination for um, a stimulant use disorder or a methamphetamine use disorder. But what we're really going to specifically talk about today is we're going to talk about using um, buprenorphine in an outpatient setting and how to make that more trauma-informed. And I, I want to focus on this today because there's a huge push federally, as there should be, for the utilization of buprenorphine in the treatment of opiate use disorder. As we're in the midst of an opioid crisis and really an opioid overdose crisis, um, we need to be offering our clients as many services as possible. And we know that buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, when you take it in a combo product, we know that buprenorphine is really um, the gold standard for treatment of opiate use disorder. And that, of course, it, it is why you're seeing a, a push for this at the federal level. So I want us just to look just for a moment um, at some of the data around utilizing buprenorphine and also methadone um, in the treatment of opiate use disorder. So the green line you're looking at here is when we're doing treatment as usual that doesn't include any opiate agonist therapy or medication supported recovery uh, for opioid use disorder. And then you'll see the blue line is buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, and the red line is methadone. And what you're looking at is rate of recurrences of use um, per 100 months of treatment. And you can see just immediately um, that when we use non-opiate agonist treatments, so when we just do psychosocial support and therapies, the rate of recurrence of use, especially in those first couple months, is almost nine times as high. And that's a really, really dangerous recurrence of use. So if someone has a recurrence of use after a period of abstinence, the risk of death in that recurrence of use is, um, it's high, it's a high risk of death. And so we really, really wanna decrease recurrences of use and get people engaged in recovery utilizing buprenorphine and other agonist therapies because we know that it has the best long-term efficacy and really helps people to stay alive. So not just treat the disorder, but it ensures that our community members continue to live. So we're going to dive into to how to do that buprenorphine work in a way that's really attentive to people that have a history of trauma. 
So when we think about safety, and we think about safety um, from a trauma-informed perspective, the first thing that comes to mind is offering immediate access to medication-supported recovery. Uh, we have such a we have such a sort of belief in the recovery service system that people need to prove a desire to recover. Uh, I remember when I first started working at my agency, it often took about three to four days for people to get into our withdrawal management center. And people needed to come every morning and they would be admitted on day three or four. And part of it was that we were short on resources, but the way that we allowed that to continue was we said people really need to prove that they want to recover. And so we want to see them every day for three or four days in a row to prove that they want to get into services. And a trauma-informed system says the moment you're ready to recover, we have treatment for you on demand. And part of where this started to, the idea of allowing treatment on demand really started to land for me was working with one of our peers, a fabulous peer, her name is um, Lisa Shields. And uh, Lisa and I have done some trauma-informed recovery classes together before. She actually came up through our MSR programming and, and then has helped us to design that programming to be more trauma-informed. And one of the things that she often tells me is when she was trying to get into treatment, she felt like there were barrier after barrier after barrier and that people said show up for groups all the, over and over again. Meanwhile, she didn't have stable housing. She had almost no supportive relationships. And the idea of having to call someone multiple times or several days in a row was really overwhelming for her. And the moment she found treatment that would take her right then and there and was very welcoming and engaging, that's actually the moment that shifted her to now her long-term recovery journey. And so when people have a history of trauma and they have disrupted prefrontal cortex activity, if you go back to thinking about that prefrontal cortex activity, that's about planning and control and inhibition regulation, all these things that make it really hard to do something like show up to a waitlist group every day for five days in a row, especially if you're homeless or um, if you don't have a lot of familial or, or uh, friend support at the time. So we want to create buprenorphine services where people can get treatment on demand. We also want to prioritize home inductions. Uh, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with buprenorphine, there's a couple different ways to start this medication. It is a process to start the medication. People have to stop using short-acting opioids for a period of time. And historically, a lot of providers have asked clients to come into the office to start this medication. That means that people are feeling sick, um, they're, they're going through withdrawals of opioids, and they're often in a sterile provider's office. People want to be at home while they're doing this. They want to feel safe. The experience of withdrawal from opioids actually has the same neurohormonal landscape as a PTSD flashback. So when people are having a PTSD flashback type experience from withdrawal, the last thing that they want is to be in a provider's office in a cold provider chair waiting for a nurse to check on them. Overwhelmingly, people wanna do this at home, uh, if they have a home, of course, um, in a way that feels as safe and supported as possible. And buprenorphine at this time has been around long enough that most of the clients I see already know how to do this process and they don't need a lot of monitoring. So a trauma-informed uh, buprenorphine program prioritizes home inductions whenever it's appropriate because it feels safe for clients. We also want to ensure continuation of buprenorphine despite behavior congruent with a substance use disorder. So let me break this one down a little bit. Uh, a moment ago I mentioned that the neurohormonal landscape of opioid withdrawals feels very similar or uh, is very similar to a PTSD flashback. So people will, will get very attached to their medicine because if they stop taking the medi medicine abruptly, they will experience withdrawals just like they would with any other medicine that induces tissue dependence. So they'll experience withdrawals, which means that continuation of that medicine is imperative. 
You want a system that is well organized and doesn't allow for script errors where people are dropped off for a couple of days a week or maybe a couple of days a month. You want to always make sure that that script continues. And that's even if someone's still displaying symptoms of a substance use disorder. So someone's gonna be taking buprenorphine and they may continue to use, for example, methamphetamines. This medication is to treat opioid use disorder. And even if someone engages in other symptomatic behavior, we continue the medicine. There's a great article called Next Stages of Buprenorphine Treatment that really outlines the ways in which uh, we use buprenorphine to treat opiate use disorder. It doesn't mean that we're going to erase all activity associated with other substance use disorders, but best practice is to continue that medication. The other thing that allows for safety in this client population that comes up a lot is um, navigating urine drug screens. So when people are taking any opiate agonist therapy, uh, part of keeping them safe is doing urine drug screens to ensure that there's no other substances that could be compromising their safety. Uh, it also ensures that they're taking their medication as prescribed so that we can ensure community safety. But urine drug screens, of course, bring up a lot of feelings of unsafety for our clients. And so the way to navigate that is to give as many options as possible. You wanna see if you can allow people to do a urine drug screen either before or after their provider visit or their group. You wanna see if you can allow them um, choice in the gender of whoever is attending them on their urine drug screen. If possible, you wanna do monitored urine drug screens, which is uh, less supervision than an observed urine drug screen, uh, because we know that it allows people to feel much safer. The next thing I want to talk about is trustworthiness and transparency. So again, I want to highlight the need for continuation of medicine. So clients, if we want to trust them, um, then we expect uh, that we also are trustworthy. So we're going to hold up our part of the bargain, which is to ensure that no medication errors happen where they lose continual access to their medicine. We also want to provide clear and consistent expectations about the program. So at the very first visit, you want to talk to clients about what happens if they have a recurrence of use with opioids. What happens if they have a recurrence of use with methamphetamines? What happens if there's no buprenorphine in their urine? You want to be as clear as possible about what they can expect in the program and what happens if their symptoms emerge or re-emerge while they're in the program with you. Uh, what clients want to know is they want to know exactly where the boundaries are in order to keep themselves safe. And of course, in trauma-informed uh, services, we really prioritize peers. I, I really feel that peers are the only true experts in substance use disorders and in recovery. Peers help us to reframe and reground in the client experience and they act as translators for both the care team and for the clients. So um, I'll do another shout out to Lisa Fields. Um, Lisa uh, spent so much time talking to me about you know, what it meant to be in a buprenorphine program and the kinds of things that made her feel unsafe. And so much of my practice now is based on talking to peers and, and what sort of worked for them and didn't work for them. I'll just highlight here one thing that, um, that Lisa shared with me about her story um, when she was uh, actively an IV drug user, and that's that asking for medicine, any medicine from a care provider, felt deeply shameful. So the act of asking to get onto buprenorphine in, its, in and of itself was really, really scary. And so because of that, we've changed some of the ways that we engage patients at the beginning. So those are the kinds of things where I think we can really um, lean on peers and the peer experience to help not just support clients, but to really design our programs to be more trauma-informed. Another key principle of trauma-informed care per SAMHSA is collaboration and mutuality. The piece that I really want to highlight here is that we really want to trust our clients. 
uh, so often in substance use disorder services, and I still hear language around this today, we just don't trust our clients and we assume that there's some manipulation of the system or that they're um, being skillful uh, in getting their needs met in a way that is not pro-social, in a way that is, is somehow unhealthy for them and the rest of the treatment community. And I just wanna um, emphasize that until you have evidence otherwise, you wanna move through this work with a deep trust for your clients and their knowledge of their bodies and their own recovery journey. So some of the ways where I think this shows up is really a low barrier to the monoproduct medicine. And if you're not well versed in the world of buprenorphine services, this one might make, not make a lot of sense to you. But what it means is that there are two types of buprenorphine products. One, um, includes naloxone in it and makes it harder to misuse and one does not include naloxone in it. The one with without naloxone tends to be better uh, tolerated by about 20% of our clientele. Uh, naloxone can cause some side effects and adverse reactions and so when clients come to me and say that they're having an adverse reaction from the naloxone, unless I have evidence to believe something else, I'm going to immediately trust the, what the client is telling me is accurate, and I have a very low barrier to shifting them to a monoproduct medicine. Likewise, I have a very low barrier to refilling medicine at least once due to loss of medicine or theft of medicine. I always wanna see a police report if there's been a theft of medicine, but in general, as opposed to some um, buprenorphine programs that won't refill any lost medicine, I, have, I pretty quickly pivot to refilling medicine that first time because again, I wanna move through this work with a deep trust for our clients and a belief that we're collaborating in their care and that we're providing um, mutual benefit to each other. And specifically in discussing collaboration and mutuality, uh, we really wanna to tend to hard conversations, especially when those conversations have disproportionate power. So, the provider always has more power than the client in these conversations, which means that the provider needs to be especially attentive to how we maneuver through really hard and potentially shameful conversations. So one of the things I've learned in my practice is that my clients are, are gonna continue to struggle with the symptoms of substance use disorders. Buprenorphine, as you saw from the, um, the slide that talked about recurrences of use, is incredibly powerful, but it's not a cure-all. I will say that it's probably one of the most um, efficacious psychiatric medicines I've ever used. I've given people hundreds of prescriptions for lithium, Lexapro, Depakote, Zyprexa, and uh, people are all over the map in, in how they respond to those medications. Overwhelmingly, buprenorphine works well, but it doesn't mean that our clients are gonna immediately um, have pro-social and amazing skills. So when a client re-engages in care or continues to engage in care, but they're really struggling with substance use, the first thing I'm always gonna say and the sort of point I'm always gonna come back to in the conversation is just that I'm so glad that they're there and that they're safe. So I think historically in substance use disorder services, when people are struggling, um, we're quick to refer them to a high level, higher level of care, which sometimes can be just a euphemism for discharging them, or um, we sort of nag on them for, you know, what's gone wrong, why can't you manage this? And I always wanna come back to just deep communication of love for that person, which is, I'm glad you're here today and I'm, I'm glad you're safe. And then we move into a mutual conversation about how we can get back on the right track or if a higher level of care is needed at that time, what would that look like in a way that feels safest for them. And for the asymptomatic client, so the client that's just really doing awesome in services, maybe they're showing up to all their groups, they're making all their provider appointments, um, the urine drug screens, uh, are, are always as expected. Um, I'm always asking, I'm always, you know, reframing for my clients how well they're doing. They often feel like they're struggling. I want to reframe for them how well they're doing and let them know that it's really inspiring for me to watch. So I'll say something like, wow, you're doing so well. It's really amazing to watch. 
What do you think is allowing for your success? And the question is really a question about mutuality, saying, hey, I'm not the expert here. I can't assume that buprenorphine is the thing that's, you know, that's allowing you to do so well or that coming to groups is the thing allowing you to do so well. You tell me what's allowing you to do so well. And just that one question um, is so empowering for clients and helps lodge in uh, to their prefrontal cortex, what kinds of things they need to do to remain in recovery. Because what we know is that, especially for opiate use disorder, the natural history of opiate use disorder is about a, seven times in recovery services. So what that means is if I have a client and they're doing amazing, that doesn't mean that they're not going to end up back in recovery services again. And I want them to have sort of a memory of, hey, this is what, this is the muscle memory of how I did so well last time. For the client that has non-prescribed substances in the urine, I always take kind of a Columbo, um, a non-shaming, uh, what I call Columbo affect. So I say, you know, hey, I, I noticed this in your urine results. What's up with that? And not a what's up with that in, in sort of a, in, um, authoritarian way, but really a curious way um, because urine drug screens can be um, incorrect, especially if it's a very simple immunoassay or a point of service test. So I, you know, I just, I just take a curious, um, curious look at it and then we can utilize that to understand what kinds of skills were lacking where they had a recurrence of use, if they did indeed have a recurrence of use. And then when you find that you um, are really in some of those difficult conversations where you need to refer someone to a higher level of care, or let's say they're not taking their medication, um, so their urine drug screens don't have any buprenorphine, and, and it's a pretty difficult conversation because you maybe aren't going to prescribe them buprenorphine any longer. Um, we really want to focus on safety and concern in those conversations. So providers have um, sometimes providers will fall back on talking about policy or staying clean or what really recovery looks like. And we want to avoid all of that. Any of that can be shaming and make people feel dehumanized. When you talk about policy, people feel like you don't see them as an individual. When you talk about what's really being clean, it's incredibly shaming for people. So what you want to always come back to is safety, safety, safety. Your safety is my biggest priority today. My role in your life is as an addiction medicine provider or addiction, uh, you know, a substance use recovery counselor. And what I'm most concerned about today is your safety. Because I'm your provider and I care about you, I'm concerned about your safety. And we really, again, want to avoid referring to symptoms and uh, symptoms of substance use disorders as anything other than symptoms of an illness. And we really want to avoid referring to policy. When we focus on empowerment and choice, we want to build programs that can be individualized based on ASAM criteria and patient preference. So, um, for example, we want people to be able to come in and do a group week and get buprenorphine if that's what they need. And we also want people to be able to do IOP and have a lot of choices in between. Uh, historically, in substance use disorder services, we have said this is what ASAM criteria says. You either want it or you don't want it. And what that allows for is a buprenorphine, excuse me, is a barrier to medication supported recovery, which we, we know is medicine that saves people's lives. So we want to try to build services that allow people low barrier access to buprenorphine or methadone, and then also allow them as much support as they are willing to engage with at this time and not allow barriers to life-saving medication. And finally, I want to just touch um, base on historical, cultural, and gender issues just for a moment because the history of medication-supported recovery actually has a lot of interesting overlap with, um, with race and, uh, and other forms of marginalization in the U.S. 
So when we talk about trauma-informed care and we're talking about trauma, we're not just talking about trauma as an individual experience. We recognize that trauma is systemic, it's cultural. We talk about post-traumatic slavery uh, syndrome, we talk about historical trauma. And the way that this translates specifically for medication-supported recovery is that Tuskegee, um, and if you don't know about Tuskegee, please go and look into it. Tuskegee was really uh, very central in the mental landscape of the African-American and Black community in the U.S. right around the time that we were developing methadone clinics, specifically on the East Coast. And so in Black communities, um, there's a very real and le legitimate concern around medication-supported recovery, which means that we need to build systems that are particularly attentive to the cultural needs of marginalized communities, especially the Black community, because of the historical timeline um, when we were developing methadone programs on the East Coast. Interestingly enough, um, for a time period, there was less incidence of opiate use disorder in the Black community because of uh, white provider racism. So we actually treated pain less aggressively in Black clients, which meant that it was actually a protective factor for developing opiate use disorder in the Black community. And unfortunately, now we know that overdoses in the Black community related to um, opioids is skyrocketing and surpassing the white community. So again, we want to build systems that are really attentive to that. We want to make sure that we have counselors that look like our clientele, that talk like our clientele, that understand the experiences that our clientele have. So on that note, um, I'll just let you guys know that I've left a bunch of resources here for you. So most of the things I've talked about today, um, you can find them in some of the resources here. Uh, the thing that's, that's most interesting from a uh, research perspective to me is talking about the neurobiological vulnerability. So um, a lot of those resources are here. And we'll move towards questions, but I also wanted you guys to know that I'm definitely available um, for questions or you know, brief consults in the future. Uh, and here is my email address. So I think at this point we can move towards questions. Thanks so much. It was uh, wonderful to have the experience of uh, learning from you. Oh, thanks, B. Um, Meg, if you can change for the next slide. Yeah, so before we go to questions, I just want to remind you that we do surveys and that's the way we keep our webinars uh, working. We really need your feedback uh, to report on the work we are doing. It takes one minute to complete. Uh, every survey will help us to improve and continue to offer our programs. Still next. Uh, if you need certificates uh, of attendance, they are available. Uh, if you are in group, however, uh, we cannot know each individual people so that is attending. So please uh, email to the Northwest, ATT, uh, Northwest at attcnetwork.org within one business day so we can provide a certificate to you. And I think one more. And then, yes, let's start with questions. So we had a good uh, good amount. Where did they go? Hold on. Let me see where the questions are here, because I had them. Huh. Here, OK. So um, our first question is, uh, Wondering about the Bernice method for starting people on Suboxone so they don't have to be in withdrawal. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. The Bernese method is a specific way of helping patients um, very comfortably uh, complete the induction process from a short-acting opioid to um, buprenorphine product. I would say I don't actually know a lot about it. What I do know um, is that it's widely used in Canada and Europe. Um, and it is, it's definitely, um, what, what I know about it is that it's proving to be a very safe and comfortable way for clients to complete the induction process. And it looks like the second part of this question um, is thoughts on heroin assisted treatment and safe supply programs. And um, I'm going to, I have sort of a similar answer for that, which is that uh, we have heroin assisted treatment programs. Um, 
uh, globally. Um, I think we're very far from those in the US, but they globally have amazing research behind them. Um, buprenorphine is an incredibly safe uh, and sort of specific and odd partial opioid agonist. And I think it will probably at this time remain our sort of go-to for the treatment of opiate use disorder. And we know that when people have poor response to buprenorphine, um, methadone is a fabulous option, and heroin-assisted treatment is also a fabulous option, although, again, um, probably pretty far into the future here in the U.S., uh, and I would say that really the reason it's far in the future here in the U.S. is, is all based on stigma. So I know this wasn't your question, but um, one of the things we can do sort of in the immediate to decrease stigma so that people have access to all of the beneficial treatments out there um, is really to use uh, that anti-stigma language. So really focusing on what the research says around um, language that's not stigmatizing. Wonderful. Uh, Zach has a question here about the certificate on the email address. We'll uh, answer to you uh, another time. If Meg can go back to the slide uh, that says the email, that'll be helpful maybe. Can I just clarify that if you are attending right now, you don't have to do anything. You will get a certificate automatically. You only need to email if you're watching with a group of people. Perfect. Thanks, Meg. I was wondering yeah. about that myself, so yeah. it's like better not Sorry. to promise. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so let's keep going here. What is your outlook on medication for teens in treatment at uh, OP? Uh, that's a really, really great question. Um, I'm going to see if I can go, oh, I can't go back in the slides, but I want uh, if listeners can, if they can visualize the recurrence of use slide that I put up. And uh, you'll remember that the treatment as usual was the green, um, which had a really high rate of recurrence of use, and then buprenorphine and methadone were towards the bottom. And um, I love to talk about that slide, and if we weren't talking about highly stigmatized medications, I want you guys to think about that slide and think about my five-year-old. I just, um, just kind of went into retirement so I could spend more time with my five-year-old. If my five-year-old developed a fatal cancer and you looked at that slide and it was uh, cancer treatment, everyone would pick the methadone line because that's, uh, a, if, if it was a fatal cancer, we'd pick the, the most intense um, and effective treatment. And so uh, when I think about teens, we absolutely wanna provide medication-supported recovery to teens. People are often fearful of this because they believe that teens will then develop tissue dependence on this medication and it'll be hard to come off of and um, we don't wanna get teens addicted to something else. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is that there's a difference between addiction and tissue dependence. These medications are life-saving medications that change the course of an illness, and they don't have to be long-term. So especially when teens have less prefrontal cortex activity than adults, medication is still the gold standard. And they may be on it for five or six years, and then we slowly taper off when um, the tapering readiness inventory, which is a uh, evidence-based method for understanding when people are able to come off medication-supported recovery, when that tool says they're able to come off medication, then we can pull the medication back. But absolutely, we want to use medications for teenagers. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, I think you had addressed this somewhat already, but uh, here goes the questions. Do you require someone to abstain from stimulant use when they are on, on buprenorphine? I think a lot of people struggle with having a problematic relationship with one drug and not another, and the expectation that they need to stop using drugs entirely. Yeah, this is such a good and common question um, because I think there's, there's sort of an expectation that when people engage in recovery services, that they, um, that they immediately want to be abstinent from all substances and that they have the skills to be abstinent from all substances. And that's not always the case. So we absolutely continue people on buprenorphine when they're using other substances. Uh, what I'm looking for is really around impairment. So if someone is continuing to use, let's say methamphetamines, and they're really impaired, so maybe they're, they're becoming increasingly psychotic because of methamphetamine use. Um, maybe they're living on the streets and their life is pretty chaotic. 
I may refer them to a daily dispense clinic. Um, but what I'm thinking about is not are they using other substances, but how are those substances impairing their life? And can I continue to keep them safe in an outpatient setting? So the question here is not are they using a subst another substance or not? The question is can I keep them safe in an outpatient setting? And providers are going to have different um, sort of expectations and understandings of that. I have a relatively low barrier for continuing someone in an outpatient setting and I will make a referral to a higher level of care or a daily dispense setting um, if I think that someone's uh, functionality is really impaired and they're deeply, uh, they're deeply impaired. Great, thank you. Oftentimes we will run into individuals who are currently going through legal issues. Most courts, especially drug treatment courts, prohibit any form of MAT. How do we contend with these individuals long term? Are the courts closer to recognizing the relationship between trauma and SUD? Oh, this, this question really breaks my heart. Um, I am lucky to live in uh, a location in Portland, Oregon, where medication-supported recovery is not as stigmatized as it once was, and we actually now have buprenorphine available to clients in the jail, um, and we have judges who are suggesting uh, buprenorphine and other forms of medication-supported recovery, and it is unfortunate that across, um, across the U.S., criminal justice systems are not recognizing these medications as being as powerful as they are and as being true recovery. So this is one of the ways in which, as care providers, we also have to become activists. So we have to both see the clients who are in front of us and provide them with best possible treatment, but we also sometimes need to get involved a little bit in the systems. So um, in, in this particular question, I would suggest um, to the person that asked a question to try to see, you know, how, how can you get out and do education for parole officers, for, for judges? Uh, what kinds of connections can you make in the community to start to allow the community to understand opiate agonist therapy as being A, real recovery, and B, life-saving medication? And then the final part of the question, I think, was are the courts closer to recognizing the relationship between trauma and substance use disorders? And again, I think where I live, uh, the courts are starting to understand the relationship a little bit more. I just did a training for some judges and some parole officers just a couple weeks ago, actually. Um, so I, th I think that, I think we are moving in the right direction, but I think we have a long way to go. Um, one thing that I think is really promising is that ASAM just redefined addiction and they actually use the word trauma. I'll have to go and look it up. I don't know it word for word, but they actually use the word trauma in their newer definition of addiction. And that's huge. If, um, if ASAM is starting to recognize the connection to trauma, we're going to see, I think, a lot of other parts of our culture and society understand the connection um, between trauma and substance use disorders. Wonderful. So I'm going to make a, a, a last question. Uh, well, there is two uh, next questions. So before I get to them, if we have the time, I just want uh, you guys to uh, be mindful of our next webinar, the December webinar. Uh, it will be on uh, team-based care approach to provide addiction-focused consults in a hospital setting. So stay tuned for that and hope to see you. Uh, then um, let's get to at least one more question uh, and we'll see what we can do. What is the difference between monitor and observed urine drug screen? So the difference between monitored and observed is actually a SAMHSA definition, I believe. And monitored means that you are in the room while someone is leaving a urine sample. So you're um, in a bathroom, let's say, but, but the person leaving the sample is in the stall. So you're not actually watching them, but you're in the room with them. Observed drug screens, you're actually watching the stream of urine, the, the sample, leave the client body. So that's the difference. So in trauma-informed care, we want to go towards monitored if we can. Some drug courts, et cetera, will um, mandate observed, but we want to go towards monitored unless it's clinically indicated to do higher observation. And I think, do I have time to just answer this one last question? You definitely have. You have two minutes. Okay, great. So um, this last question says, we're at a juncture where we need to decide about drug toxic screening method and are leaning towards utilizing mouth swabs versus urine drug screens. 
mouth swabs are absolutely less invasive and more trauma-informed. Unfortunately, they don't have a CLIA waiver, so um, they're, not, they're, not, they're sort of not ready for prime time use for most clinical settings. So if your clinic needs to be CLIA waived, with, which most do, um, mouth swabs are not yet ready is my understanding. But they are absolutely a better clinical, uh, they are more trauma-informed, I'll just say that. Definitely. Less shaming for sure, less invasive. Absolutely. Okay, I really want to thank you for your uh, knowledge, for sharing your experience with us. And uh, thanks for everybody attending. And uh, we hope to see you uh, in our next webinar. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.